Hello, welcome to Team M Shoots. Uh, today we're going to be doing extensors of the wrist. Now I know this is a hard topic, so I've slowed down the text for us, and I'm going to post pictures of the slides as well, so you guys can use them for your notes. So the key to this is learning them by principles. Um, there's four major groups, and they're sort of grouped by name and function to some degree. Uh, so first we'll learn some keywords, um, and these will take you through both the extensors, flexors, uh, it's also in all parts of anatomy in some degree. Um, and it's easier to learn these keywords rather than learning the individual muscles um, in themselves. So brevis just means short, like brief, um, and longus means long, as the name suggests. And they nearly always occur together, or there's at least a matching muscle, um, not necessarily in the same group, uh, so a pollicis is a thumb muscle, and digitorum just means that the muscle goes to the digits, so the fingers. Uh, we've got carpi, which means that it inserts into the arm, so this is involved in wrist movements rather than the actual finger movements. <coughs> and yeah, abduction and adduction or deviation, as I'll discuss later. So yeah, all these, all these keywords go for both flexors and extensors, as I said, and also in the leg as well. So we've got the first three groups here. We've got the radialis group. Uh, you can see down the bottom left, we've got the extensor groups. And then on the bottom right, we've got the pollicis groups. So let's start with the radialis group. So all of these muscles extend from the lateral epicondyle. Um, and if you put your arm outstretched and have your palm facing the computer as we speak, the lateral ep epicondyle is the thumb side of your humerus, so the most sort of protuberant part of your humerus. Um, but for, for the remainder of this actual video, all the pictures will be the back part of the forearm, um, the, the posterior compartment. It actually makes a sort of dimple um, right on that protuberant bit called the common extensor origin. So yeah, as I'm writing now, note that that's a posterior forearm. So not the palm side, the opposite side. So technically, uh, brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus actually extend a little bit higher up um, from the supracondylar ridge, uh, which is just above that lateral epicondyle, as you can see on the picture. Um, and these are the first muscles that extend. So they're actually the most lateral of the extensors. Um, so let's just go through them individually now. Also note that the common extensor origin is actually a central tendon uh, through which all the extensor group and all the radialis group except brachioradialis and ECRL actually insert into the lateral epicondyle. So let's start with brachioradialis. It's the lateral most and most superficial. So on dissection, you see it first. Um, it inserts into the radial styloid, which is a little extension of the radius and it flexes at the wrist. Um, this is actually an exception to all the others. As you can see here, it actually flexes. So yeah, it's an exception to all the other extensors in the posterior compartment of the forearm. Uh, so ECRL inserts into the second metacarpal um, and ECRB inserts into the third metacarpal. Look at my bone lectures to learn about the metacarpals. Um, but together they extend and radially deviate. So they move the whole hand without moving any of the digits or any extension of flexion towards the thumb side. Um, it's, actually, it's actually quite hard to do in isolation. So now we've got the same photo. Let's look at the extensor, extensor sorry, uh, group. Now, these group all extend from the common extensor origin, um, and they have a central tendon of insertion, okay? And they're slightly lower down, actually, from the lateral epicondyle than the radialis group. Um, so let's go through them individually, as we've been doing. So extensor carpi ulnaris. As I said, carpi means it inserts into the, arm, the actual arm muscles. So it inserts into the ulnar bone. Um, and it wraps around and lies edge to edge with flexor carpi ulnaris from the other side. So these two actually form the medial border um, of your forearm, which is the little finger side. Um, 
And so those two muscles form that border there. And it can contract with FCU, which is flexor carpi ulnaris on the other side, to create ulnar deviation. So moving your whole hand to, at the wrist towards your little finger. So extensor digitorum, um, which is the bulk muscle of the posterior forearm, uh, it splits from a central body into four tendons for each of the four fingers. And the tendon itself actually splits into like three tendinous slips. Um, two move laterally around the phalanx and insert into the distal phalanx, so the last joint on your finger. And the remaining slip goes between those two lateral slips and enters into the middle phalanx um, for that, that middle extension. So extensor digiti minimi is actually sort of part of extensor digitorum. It's like a little belly that starts and sort of branches off the central belly of the extensor digitorum. And it forms its own little extensor muscle that inserts into the fifth metacarpal, which is the little finger, hence minimi. Um, and it has the same tenderness arrangement as extensor digitorum. So you can just see here, I've just shown that's what extension is. So that's extension of the wrist, um, and that's what all those muscles essentially achieve in some way. So let's start with the pollicis group. This is a photo of a deeper muscle. You can see they've cut the common extensor origin, um, and you can see those deeper muscles. This group actually splits those two groups. That's how I remember it. Um, so just think of the thumb splitting the extensor and radialis. They all arise from the long... The shaft of the long bone, they overlie and the adjacent interosseous membrane. That's a rule for all deep muscles, okay? So let's start with abductor pollicis longus. So it's the lateral most muscle. Um, we'll see later in the anatomical snuff box, it forms that little border on the base of your wrist. Um, it inserts into the first metacarpal of the thumb and it pulls the thumb away from midline. Um, so th that's called abduction. And I'll show you a little clip now to show you the difference between abduction and adduction. So adduction, pulling away, abduction towards midline. Away, towards. <clears throat> um, there's heaps of videos to see abduction and adduction, I thought I'd just put in a little clip. Um, so extensor pollicis brevis travels along the thumb in the most direct route. Um, so it goes straight, straight through along the thumb phalanx um, and hence the name brevis, as I said earlier. So it inserts into the middle phalanx um, and extends at that joint. And extensor pollicis longus actually moves under the extensor retinaculum, which is this uh, thickening of fascia that cover all the tendons. I'll show you a picture later. Um, but it actually goes sort of towards the middle of the wrist and then diverts towards the thumb and extends to the distal phalanx, as the name longus suggests. Um, and together, these two tendons, when you, if you extend your thumb right up, you can see that tendon you're looking at now is extensor pollicis longus. Um, so see how it's from the wrist and then sort of diverse towards the thumb, whereas brevis runs along at the whole length. And it also runs under the dorsal tubicle of your radius, um, which is this little extension of bone. So now let's look at the anatomical snuff box. So I want you to point your thumb up to the ceiling with your hand flat on the table. Now you'll see a little gap little gap formed on the most lateral side. You can see on the diagram just there, um, you've got two tendons that form almost a little triangular box. You've got to extend quite hard, but you can feel along, and it's a very important clinical landmark for wrist injuries. So it's actually floored by scaphoid, a carpal bone. Um, I'll be making a video about carpal bones at a later stage, but you can look it up for yourself. It's just a bone of the wrist, um, and it's a key one in terms of fractures. The radial artery actually traverses it, and you've got the two extensor pollicis tendons on either side. So you've got brevis running on the more thumb side and longus along the thumb itself. Um, and APL is the most lateral border. <clears throat> yeah, and it's very, it's very important um, for deeming whether there's fractures of the scaphoid, which are very important. So if you ever think someone's got a fractured wrist, just sort of push in that area. And if it hurts really bad, they probably fractured their scaphoid. So let's go through the deep group. This is the only group that's sort of non-homogenous, so all sort of random muscles. Um, and they've got funny names. So Ancaneus, uh, it's a triangular muscle in the back of the forearm. Um, it's from the lateral epicondyle to the posterior ulna, as you can sort of see there. And I think it has a main role in um, pronation, uh, but you'll have to look that up for yourself. 
Um, so supinator is the main supinator of the forearm besides biceps. So we'll look at the two. So supinator is when you open your palm out for like a hand bowl of soup. And pronation is when you pour the soup out. Pro, pour, close enough. Um, and supinator in sheaths or in circles, the proximal radius. Um, and it has its own sheath. And its most important feature besides supination, it's got two heads and it actually um, sort of encloses the deep radial artery, uh, radial nerve branch, uh, which is a key landmark for my later video on nerves. So the last one is sort of a random one. Uh, it's extensor indices. It's a little small, short belly muscle um, with a long tendon and it extends to the index finger. Um, it's sort of rarely seen. Uh, most diagrams won't have it and it's not particularly important, but I thought I'd add it in for completeness. So I'll just add some additional info about this topic that's important. So I said before that adductor pulsus longus goes under the extensor retinaculum. So it's a thickening of your deep fascia that runs over all the tendons um, that enter into your digits, as you can see there on the diagram. Um, and it overlies the extensor tendons to protect them from laceration, but also to stop the tendons bowstring, so moving up on extension. So it keeps them all in one plane. Um, and it has like vertical septa that form six compartments. These compartments aren't really important unless you're like a hand surgeon or something, which I don't think you'd be watching this video. But uh, it's just important to know that they do form compartments and the tendons pass through these. Um, so you can see I've pointed to these tendinous intersections. Now this is a bit of cool general knowledge. Um, science is cool, no matter what you think. Uh, the pattern of the intersections is not particularly important, uh, but it makes it difficult to extend individual fingers because when you extend along any of the muscles, you get a uh, neighboring extension of adjacent fingers. Now I'll show you a video at the end, it's kind of embarrassing, um, and it's me trying to extend each of the individual fingers. Now you see me struggling, um, and it's interesting because everyone has unique patterns. But anyway, that's it. See you later, guys. Thanks for watching.